Hello and welcome to Feathercast. My name is Rich Bowen, and today I'm going to be talking with some of the people from the Active MQ project. Before I get started, I want to remind you that ApacheCon is just three weeks away, and I'm actually wearing my ApacheCon 2000 t-shirt today in, in honor of that event. Uh, ApacheCon will be held online. The schedule and registration are now available at ApacheCon.com, and we would love to see you there. There will be a presentation at ApacheCon that features ActiveMQ, and that's going to be on Wednesday when Andre Shakirin will be speaking in a talk entitled Splitting Monolith Application to Microservices. And that will touch on ActiveMQ as well as other strategies for communication between microservices. Today, I'm speaking with a number of the people from the ActiveMQ project. And this interview is kind of cool because usually I'm just talking with one or two people. And today we have four members of the project, which is exciting. I'm going to just quickly introduce the people that are here. We have Jean-Baptiste Onfre, and we have Kleber Sakonik, and Justin Bertram, and Matt Pavlovich. And these are all members of the ActiveMQ project. Now, when I was uh, reading up on on the project ahead of time, I realized that I've already done an interview with ActiveMQ, and this was in 2007 when the project had just graduated from the incubator. And actually, my colleague uh, David Reed did the interview with uh, James Strachan back then. So I'm going to link to that uh, when I publish this, and you can compare notes between what was said then and what was said now, because the world has changed a lot in in the meantime. Words like microservices were just not a thing back then, and so it's it was interesting to go back and and listen to some of the things that James said about this project. But uh, anyway, thank you all so much for making time to talk with me. I'm going to start with the basics here. When I read on the website, it says that ActiveMQ is a flexible and powerful open source multi-protocol messaging. Can you tell me what that means in, in practical terms? Who would use this? What would they use it for? What does it do? Yeah, you know, and it's interesting that you mentioned James from back in 2007, and I think that's part of what, um, you know, when we talk about what, I, you asked the question about what ActiveMQ is used for and how it's used, and I mean, I think if you, you track just about every generation of exciting enterprise architecture has a message broker at the core. Even predating service-oriented architecture, there was a message-oriented middleware push, and now we're into microservices, and I think the next wave of that is going to be the event-driven microservices as we look, you know, everybody's looking to push into the cloud, a lot more Kubernetes work, and in the event-driven side of the microservices is a is a key piece to making all that work and, and be successful. And ActiveMQ has been, been there for all of these architectures, and I think mm -hmm. it'll continue to be there because it solves a ton of just fundamentally hard problems when it comes to sending data between systems. One of the things that we tell people when they're new to it or, or developers when they're coming on is it's it's really a Swiss army knife for connecting different systems and different applications. And that it really answers that question that developers are faced all the time, which is how do I send and receive data from another system? Um, and I think that's especially um, relevant in today's cloud environments where teams are working to integrate they have digital transformation efforts where they have to move between on-premise and get into cloud and they're they're integrating with SaaS systems and databases from all these different vendors and and ActiveMQ really goes a long way to answer that question how do I connect systems across multi you know programming languages protocols environments and, and that's really where ActiveMQ shines something that uh, is also very interesting is the existing production system a uh, large production, production system using Artemis slash ActiveMQ is pretty large uh, in the industry, uh, as, especially in Europe, in a microconductor, in a different, very different use cases. We can see that the existing stack is huge. Um, for instance, the CERN in, in Switzerland, they are using um, ActiveMQ and still using uh, it I would say daily. So yeah, I think that it's interesting to see that the assumption done in 2007 are still uh, accurate and existing, but the projects thing for from from the community evolved to address new use cases and 
and new technologies like, uh, as Matt said, uh, cloud and, and, and data integration, generally speaking. We, we can see a lot of traction and, and interaction in the community and, uh, and especially with, uh, with the guys on this call today. Um, I mean, we are driving to address new use cases, to improve uh, the project, to address new new business uh, domains. W what exists in 2007 is still uh, there, but it, it evolves since then. One of the big things about ActiveMQ is that it supports a number of different protocols, and that's for lots of different kinds of use cases, like Stomp, for example, it's one protocol that we support. And you see that often in like simple JavaScript-based web chat applications that are kind of ubiquitous on uh, customer facing websites for all kinds of different companies, right? This stupid little things that pop up when you when you go to AT&T's website, for example, and it's like, hey, what can I help you with? You know, that's probably using Stomp protocol. And then you've got like something like MQTT, which is big in the IoT space. That protocol was uh, invented to be super low latency and very, not so much simple, but supporting very small devices. And then you've got JMS, which there's a ton of enterprises out there that have architected in Java EE. JMS is the backbone of messaging in Java EE. And then AMQP, which is big in financial services, lots of different use cases. And the multi-protocol part of that is a big component there. What I think is cool about that, that you could have things like sending a messaging MQTT and consuming in a different protocol. I have seen other other brokers doing this kind of thing, like a supporting multi protocol, but like you could not cross boundaries. And what ActiveMQ does well is like when you send a message, there is, you could have a conversion from that message format to other protocols. So you could have like a very heterogeneous mixes. I think that's fairly valuable. You've already kind of addressed this question in many of your answers, but one of the challenges that I see across open source projects is that a project that's 15 years old is typically mature enough that there's not much left to do. What's new in, in the new releases of ActiveMQ and in Artemis that, that, that you're excited about and what's, what's coming soon? It sounds like a lot of the stuff you're working on is a result of the world changing around you. What else would you wanna tell people about in these, in these new releases? A lot of people are focusing in disaster recovery like uh, needing a remote site. So it was one feature that I added. We could like like a remote broker synchronized with like a low latency networks and you could fail over from one broker to the other side seamlessly. So like they are kept in sync. And recently I added like a one very nice feature for uh, replaying messages on the broker. So you could have like up to a few days in the broker as a backup and you could receive or recover any message up to that period of backup. So it's like a replaying up to a, to a certain period that you have in the broker. Uh, I was revolving about like how the users are using these days, like the, the workloads are, are changing. Since the workloads are different, so sometimes you have to make further improvements because then you have newer hardware, you may have like a faster networks, then you may have like a two, two up, like a things that were not considerably a bottleneck years ago or considered a bottleneck now. So you have to come back and review certain things that are now considered a bottleneck and improve code. So like a, so the work, just the size of the workload that we see also makes it challenging. So how does I have to keep maintaining and, um, keeping the code up to date to today's workloads. My focus is more of the integration and relationship with other Apache projects. Being able to leverage new projects in the Apache Foundation, like uh, Apache Bookkeeper, to provide new and leveraging the feature, to provide new feature in ActiveMQ for the domain we, we want to address. So better integration with Camel, with Caraf, with, with, with Bookkeeper, with others, just to be able to maybe not creating new feature or new new breaking changes feature but better existing feature and uh, especially bookkeeper for instance is a, a poc we started to to provide a storage that can be leveraged in a more cloud friendly way but having distributed storage and stuff like that so yeah the, the focus is also and it's it's the case for both factor slash artemis i mean both uh it, it could, i mean project i don't know if you can name project but 
the two parts of the, the ActiveMQ project. Um, and, and I think that it's really important to, I mean, as you mentioned, Rich, what we, we started uh, more than 10 years ago, it was 15 years ago. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity to have new projects. I'm thinking about Apache Ignite, Apache Bookkeeper, all these new projects are pretty new. And it gives us a new stuff that we can integrate into ActiveMQ. So that's my, also my focus. If I might take a, a small step back, your project has these two, these two artifacts, these two products, ActiveMQ and ActiveMQ Artemis. What's the difference? Who would need one versus the other? Or do they, are they necessary components for each other? So years ago, we had another project trying to, to leverage new technologies, new, not, not new technologies, but like a, some of the newer programming techniques that they would like to add to the broker. Uh, that was Apache Apollo, uh, ActiveMQ Apollo. We thought it was a good idea to, to bring new technologies into ActiveMQ. So we donated Artemis to ActiveMQ. And we wanted to make it like a like a Apollo back then was intended to be the next generation of Factor and Q. So we we thought Artemis, I mean, back then was Hornet Q that when it donated to Factor and Q community, I thought we thought it would be a a nice future uh, feed for Factor and Q community. So we thought Artemis could be the next generation of Factor and Q. But we still have people using the previous version of ActiveMQ, uh, and so so at this point we have a split. But we still have users using ActiveMQ. We couldn't find a better name. We call it ActiveMQ Classic. And we have users using ActiveMQ Artemis, and we were all part of the same community. We're trying to be part of the same community. Better yeah, name. I mean, I think Rich, you know, you mentioned how it's a 15-year-old project, and and how the world just changes all around. And so, you know, as, as Klebert was mentioning, wanting to, if you want to go experiment with new programming models, you know, non-blocking IO and reactive, and those things are difficult to introduce into something that's extremely stable, um, like ActiveMQ is and continues to be, and is also continually, uh, just how widespread it is. It's difficult to say, hey, users, you know, take this risk on, you know, while we experiment in the development community. Um, and so it's just taking a different path to, hey, let's go build a new, against a new programming model to build up the feature set and go experiment with that um, till we can get that stable and then allow users to come into it when they're ready. And then when the community feels like it's ready, the community can make a decision. A lot of it speaks to just the value of ActiveMQ and how, you know, as a project and as a community really values the users and understands, hey, if you're taking on a piece of infrastructure, you know, we want to respect that. We don't want to treat it lightly and, and you know, really respect that user base. Hey, you're going to get something that's stable, um, well-run, well-proven, while we're now taking a look eye in the future about how to improve things, make things run faster, add more features, things of that nature. Um, yeah, so both brokers are still running and, and doing things healthy, and it's it's providing a two-user base. So it's it's definitely a, a different approach than we've seen in other areas, but I think it's a, it's a good model for people to look at and, and look from how to manage open source projects, too. You know when you want to do because there's there's been cases where other projects have not had success in taking these big things and these aren't fun conversations to have um you know that it comes with a lot of emotion a lot of people are putting in a ton of time users put in a ton of time on training and when you look in the past that you know other projects have not succeeded in making a big transition so um you know i think it's a bold thing and, and it's something that other projects should should look to and look at as a model well i see this as a value for the active mq project because uh, if I compare with other Apache projects, like uh, for instance, if you take a look on Camel, we have Camel K, we have Camel Spring Boot, we have Camel Caraf, we have different flavor of, of Camel. And for me, ActiveMQ is uh, quite the same. We have different fla two flavors and up to the user to pick the one they want. It's not, for me, it's not one, it's not a replacement of, of the other. It's just two different vision, two different artifacts. And it's up to the user to, to to choose the one they want. Both evolve, both provide good features and powerful features. Uh, again, and I agree with Matt, it's where we provide really value because it's up to the users to decide if they want to switch or to keep on the existing platform, whatever. So it can be a little bit intimidating to try to join a project that's this mature. Um, if somebody is interested in coming and participating in your project, what skills do they need? What, what languages? 
uh, is your project written in? And, and what, uh, what particular skills are you looking for in, in new contributors? Documentation and website. <laughs> that's, that's for me the major unit test. point. Unit test. Sample, <laughs> code. Unit test. <laughs> Sample code. Yeah. yeah, no, honestly, today, I think that the major issue we have uh, in the project, generally speaking, is uh, some mess in the documentation and accuracy in the documentation. Maybe some documentation is not mo no more up to date or stuff like that. So any contribution around website uh, in terms of content, uh, I don't care about the look and feel, but <laughs> for me, that's not the, the, really the discussion. But in terms of content and documentation, updating documentation feature, uh, use cases that you can address, that would be very great. I mean, we are all here developers, so we are focusing on the code and sometimes we are we, we should take a more look on, on our user documentation and uh, it definitely is where it's painful, but I think it's where we should improve. The reason the website is, is such an issue is because it's, it's gathered so much content over the lifetime of the project, you know, those 15 years. If you go to the, uh, the Wayback Machine and you go back to like 2007 or whatever and look at the website, it is essentially the same for like the next gosh, until maybe two years ago, it's essentially the same. So much of the content, you know, it was like this confluence-based thing where people could go in and add stuff and and people did all the time and, and stuff just accumulated there. We went through a major website redesign just a couple of years ago, but a lot of that content, you know, not, not all of us knew what to do with it necessarily. So we, so it's still there, especially on the on the 5.x, on the, the classic broker. There's a lot of that stuff. The Artemis, the documentation for Artemis is 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 architected a little bit differently. So, and it's obviously it's it's newer. So, the organization there is a little different. But yeah, I mean, updating the content on the website, I think, is is a big is a big need. The both brokers are written in Java. The Apollo broker that that was attempted that Clebert mentioned to be the next generation, it was actually written in, in Scala, which is I think one of the reasons why it didn't take off as much. And really get a community around it. I mean, anybody who's willing to learn and is interested in messaging. I mean, it's a big, it's a big space. So lots of people are are interested in it. I have been personally taking a fair interest in testing. Uh, you no, know, like uh, um, I would welcome users uh, uh, promoting testing or or anything that will show issues. I think we should improve a lot more testing for both sides. I have recently come across uh, the fact that a lot of times we treat software like uh, no uh, survival bias. No, we only fix what users tell us to do. And if you do that, like we only fix the holes. And I don't know, if you're, if you're looking for survival bias, Wikipedia, you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I think uh, like we should do a lot more testing and I have been trying to, to get like a people I work with to, to, to promote testing. And you don't need to be a very advanced programmer, like just like a, like a willing to do. And like, of course, I, I, I welcome anyone on the community to do features as well, but like a testing, I think is a big thing. You know, there's a lot of people interested in messaging and integration. You know, every day somebody's added to a messaging or integration team, or somebody becomes a tech lead of an integration or messaging team. And so, it's an opportunity for them to get plugged into ActiveMQ in, you know, as, as uh, Jean-Baptiste indicated, you know, if we have gaps in that, what's that first five minute experience look like? I think it would be an opportunity for people to come in and say, hey, these are the things we need. There's more than enough willing members to help guide them through that. And so I think it, there's always an opportunity for coming, someone to come in and say, hey, it's, a, it's been a couple of years since we've seen these stories in ActiveMQ. What is it like today, you know, in a, in a Java 11 environment? with everything that's changed. What is that day, you know, that first five minutes, that first week experience? And so I think it's an opportunity for someone not only to contribute to the project, but they could also, you know, blog about that, um, share their experience. Cause you know, all of us here have been doing this a long time and we can talk about messaging and the benefits, but it's really more powerful when the users share their stories, because I think those connect better with what other users experience. You know, they can connect to that closer. There's more credibility. A lot of times we're talking in, in big words or, you know, the, the language and the terminology is new and the product, like, there's too many new things, right? What's a queue? What's a topic? What is the, what is the difference between durable and persistent? Like all these things are, you know, can be really complicated and overwhelming up front. So I think it's an opportunity for somebody that they could come in and 
start a blog series, start a video chat, say, hey, I'm sitting down with ActiveMQ day one. This is what I did. And I contributed, you know, these blog articles and I helped clean up some of the documentation and and then go from there. And then it's it's an easy get into the things like testing, unit test, and a lot of the key contributors of ActiveMQ came in that way. I know that's that's how I got in was was coming from the user side. So there's plenty of stories like that and, and some of the top committers came in. Um, you know, starting that way and people that are well known named in the community too. So definitely encouraged, definitely welcome. With the Java ecosystem moving along so quickly and new new releases of the JDK coming out, how do you all deal with that? And how do your users handle older installs that, that haven't upgraded yet? So on the Artemis land, we are moving with the minimal requirement to JDK 11 on the broker side. For newer clients, they will require also JDK 11 for newer clients. For users uh, still needing JDK 8, so they can still use the clients of older versions of Artemis with JDK 8. Because the broker supports so many different protocols, there's lots of different clients in all kinds of different languages, even in Java, that are not shipped by the broker. So the broker ships a JMS implementation client, both brokers do. But there's, you know, NQP clients written in Java, you know, all those different kinds of clients are supported by their own communities. So if you have, a, you know, an AMQP client, Java-based, maybe it's Cupid JMS or something, you know, they will control which Java version hmm. okay. uh, they support, you know, ongoing. So there's a lot of that stuff that, that we don't control as a broker. For me, it's two different parts, about the client part and the broker part. Uh, the thought we did on the ActiveMQ Classic part is really to have a both JDK 8 and 11 support in 5, uh, 7, uh, 15. And then we, we upgrade to JDK 11 completely for 5.16. And the target is re to remove the JDK 8 for 5.17. So it means that uh, whatever the, the client is going to use as a JDK version, does it, it should not impact too much the, the, the broker side, even if sometimes it's not really possible. But most of the time, I mean, we have to address currently the JDK 11 is the LTS version. And so that's why we, we should upgrade pretty fast. And uh, we put the effort on, on this version for the ActiveMQ Classic version and Artemis as well. Uh, and pretty soon we, we should drop the JDK 8 version. And we did, uh, especially Matt and myself, we did some cleanup on the ActiveMQ uh, Classic because we, we maintain, for instance, LevelDB was a pretty old in terms of version, Scala, and all this stuff. So uh, it, it means that it has also an impact for, for our internally to a project, depending to the upgrade we, we need and we have to do. And it also, uh, the part for, for JDK for sure, but also for the third party project we, we embed, uh, I'm thinking about Camel 2 that we're still using and we, we decided to, re, to remove it because simply we are not ready to upgrade to Camel 3. Definitely the, the good thing about ActiveMQ is we, uh, we embrace the community and we share a lot of details on the main list just to, to, to inform the users and to, to have a consensus internally to, to the project. And any decision is taken by a consensus, and I think it's, it's the way we should do that. In addition to the JDK change, we have the JEE to Jakarta migration. And so this adds another fun wrinkle um, in all of this. And so I think what a lot of other projects are doing, and we've had some conversations recently about how to better communicate this, how ActiveMQ is doing this on the website as well. So architects that are planning can have an understanding of what to expect. It's the concept of doing like release streams, you know, is just adding on to like what JBO was talking about with 5.16 on, on the ActiveMQ stream is going to be, you know, maintain Java 8 going forward. And that'll be the classic Java X APIs, JEE APIs, and then as we go 17, 18 and on. So those are things that we will put in to the website that'll be, be the indicators. So it'll kind of look like a chart. It'll say, hey, if you need this JDK, you know, this version of the JE, this is kind of your release stream, and then kind of give you an opportunity to plan how you want to do your upgrades and migrations to make it all fit. Because we're pulling in artifacts from other projects. This is probably the biggest ecosystem change in Java we've ever seen. Um, having been around from like four to five, that was a big, big change as well. And there's a lot of the same keeping, you know, clients for old JDKs. But the fact that we're changing the JDK and these fundamental Java APIs at the same time, this is not, not really ever happened. So 
a lot of the a lot of the projects are cross communicating. You've got like Eclipse and Jetty and Apache, and not to mention non Apache stuff, real quick. But we're all coordinating because it's a, it's a big Java ecosystem, and we're all trying to follow similar concepts because we all use parts and stuff from each other. And so if we can all baseline, then that's just going to make everything better for users. So a lot of work on the background, and, and hopefully we can present that in a nice, simple way, like on websites, so users don't have to go and dig through, you know, gobs of mailings to figure out where things are at or palm files and get PRs and all that stuff. So we're hoping to put it out on the website um, and for users to be able to track it there. Tell me about your container story. I would, well, I've got the I've got the ticket. I was gonna say I've got the ticket. I, I think I own the issue on the the ActiveMQ five side. So yeah, we're we're gonna we want to publish an official uh, image into public image re repositories so that users, again, going back to that first five minutes experience, they can just download and fire something up, you know, on their laptop. Um, so we very much want to enable those users, and so we'll be knock on wood planning on within that five seventeen stream releasing an official image. And this also aligns with the JDK thing. We don't want to publish an image with JDK 8 because if you're going to containers now, we should say, let's let's go to something that's supported full stack. So we'll be pushing out something on, uh, or at least the plan is on 11 uh, in official uh, image repositories for the ActiveMQ 5 broker. It doesn't mean that ActiveMQ Classic is not yet able to run on, on, on a container. Uh, if I take my experience at Thailand, we are running ActiveMQ as Docker and Kubernetes for more than two years now on on the Amazon and Azure uh, mm -hmm. platform we are using in production. So we we just have the end packages just to create the, the, the Docker image when we need and, and deploy it. So it's it just a new thought we did on our side, but uh, all the ecosystem is already ready to, to go like this. Uh, what Matt mentioned, and I think he, what he proposed is great, is just to move forward for the users just to download. I mean, is what we did for a bunch of our Apache projects. Like, uh, yeah, on Docker Hub, you have a Docker image and just, just run it. So, so that's, that's the next step. But I think that both Artemis and ActiaQ Classic are already ready to run like this. And uh, most of the users are doing that when they're using on the cloud on, or, or on the private cloud, whatever. So I have some experiences with uh, AKS, with uh, OpenStack. And, I mean, there are different a way of running like this is just at the end of the day just a java application so we it's just a new thought to wrap it up but uh, it's a java application like another so to wrap up where do we come to talk to your project we have a contact uh list on the active mq website uh you can contact us through slack or through the users forums or through the dev forums we're pretty active on slack although it's not instant messaging like uh, we won't be like a full time there, but like uh, Slack is also a possibility. So I would prefer like for if you want to ask a question, go to the user list. If you have uh, found an issue, I welcome a uh, test contribution and the Jira open. <laughs> and anyway, if it doesn't happen on the main list, it, it never happens. <laughs> right. Well, thank you all again so much for your time. Thank you all for participating in this and, and we look forward to, to seeing what happens in the coming years with your project. Bye.